Hey, Social Work uh, 321 students. Welcome to uh, the first lecture for week one. We are gonna talk about a lot of things today. Um, I'm really excited about this class. This is one of my favorite classes to teach. I know that not all of you in this course are social work majors. Some of you take it just for an upper division elective and that it actually works really well for anybody in any interest in the behavioral health sciences. So let's talk today about four different subjects. I'm going to share with you, uh, first of all, some concepts that we've already discussed in our Zoom meeting and that you've read about in your first chapter. And that is, first of all, a systems approach. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that is and why social workers focus on that. And then the second area that we're going to talk about is um, some of the skills that social workers need. And obviously this applies to anybody interested in behavioral sciences. The third thing is the phases of social work practice, what those are, why they're important. And then the last will be dimensions of professionalism. So let's start out talking about the systems theory approach. Why is that important? As we, as we talked about in our Zoom meeting, everybody has a unique worldview, right? And one of the things that I think is really important for social workers to really, really comprehend is that everybody has a right to their perspective of the world. Why? Because we all have a unique uh, perspective. We all have a unique approach to life. We've all had our own different set of experiences and we all live in a different system. Even if you were raised by the same parents as your siblings, you are going to have a different perspective than they do because of your birth order, because of your gender, uh, for a lot of reasons. We all have unique experiences. So what is the systems approach? If you took Social Work 101 from me, <laughs> you've probably already seen this analogy, but I really like it. This is a barushka, it's from Russia. My, um, my husband's parents lived in Russia for a while, and so they brought this home for me. And it's one of my favorite things. My grandkids think it's an awesome toy, but I think it's a great visual aid for systems approach. So we all live within systems, within systems, within systems. So if I went down to the very tiniest, I'd have to go 10 times, but I'm not gonna go that far. So let's pretend this is the individual, okay? Now an individual has their own unique perspective of the world, they see things in a unique way, they have their own unique experiences as an individual. The study of psychology is the study of individuals, how they think, what motivates them, yada, yada, yada. So what does motivate them? Their cultures, right? An individual is within a family culture, right? So this is the first system that they're a part of, and that culture helps define what their worldview is going to be about, all right? So let's say you are the last born in a family of uh, workaholics. <laughs> Maybe you're gonna have a very different perspective than the first born or the middle born children in that family. And this is an important part of who you are, and it's definitely one of the subcultures that you're a part of. Of course, a child's very first perspective has to do with not only their birth order, but with their family culture. What's important to that family? In some families, what's really important might be, and this could represent a lot of different things, for some family, sports are really, really important. And so this becomes another subculture that, that the whole family is a part of. Uh, this could also be church or uh, any other organization that's a bigger organization than what that family unit is. And within that, there, there might be other subcultures that family's a part of, maybe the, the educational system that the family is a part of. And then the, the culture that they're a part of, which uh, we probably don't refer to as a subculture, is the society that they live in. So that, I hope that helps you better understand the systems approach. 
It's so important for anybody working in a mental health profession or, or you know what, in any profession to really understand that we're going to have a unique motivation, we're going to have a unique perspective of the world, and we're all a part of all of these different subcultures, and even our, our worldview, our perspective within where we are in our society is going to be unique because of all these. And so that is the systems approach. And we recognize when we work with individuals in a professional capacity that they have a right to their perspective. They have a, a right to their approach to understanding what the world's all about. And when we're helping someone work through challenges, it's very important to validate that they have a, a, a unique approach and a perspective that is unique. So there you go. Uh, let's move on to that uh, second topic that I told you we would talk about and that is social work skills. What are they? I think critical thinking is one of the most important skills that you can have as a social worker. Your textbook says, when combined with lack of critical thought, insufficient knowledge about safe and effective services can result in damage to individuals, families, groups, organizations, communities, and societies. So, when we don't use critical thinking, when we have an assumption that everybody has the same worldview that we do, we not only get ourselves in trouble, we can get clients in trouble and we can um, mess up entire systems. We can mess up individuals and we might be well-meaning in what we're trying to do, but a big part of critical thinking is understanding that there are unique cultures, there are unique subcultures, to everybody, and so thinking critically, recognizing that um, things aren't always what they look like. An example that I like to give is uh, there was one incident in which child sex traffickers disguised themselves as CPS, Child Protective Service workers, and would come to the door of young families in um, poverty-stricken areas and would literally take the children away and, and um, kidnap these kids and get them involved in um, sex trafficking. So what, if, what do we do in a situation like that? Obviously, if you went into that situation as a professional following something like that, you would get a lot of backlash from families in the area who would accuse social services for something that really wasn't their fault. But if you step back, use some critical thinking and recognize there's a reason people are feeling the way they are, <laughs> um, validate that they, they have a right to feel the way they are, what happened was horrific and it shouldn't have happened. And uh, so that's an example of a situation in which someone needs to use some critical thinking. Another area that, uh, that I like to point out is an important area of critical thinking. I, I did a presentation for a, um, a K through eighth grade school in which we were talking about uh, suicide prevention. And um, a woman came along to help me give this presentation who had not had very much uh, professional training. And in the course of the conversation, with the students, she volunteered her phone number. She, you know, and, and it came from a place of compassion. She wanted to help these kids understand that if, if they were having these thoughts of suicide, she wanted to be there for them. So she's handing out her personal phone number. Yeah, call me. If you're feeling bad, then call me, you know? And, and that's very well-meaning. That's wonderful that someone would be that selfless, but um, it's not always good judgment to just you know, willy-nilly give out your phone number to, to random people. Um, and obviously, there are boundaries that we need to establish as professionals. Everything that we talk about in this course, I want you to remember, this is, um, what we're doing is basically professional training. We're training ourselves to become the professionals that um, will be competent as well as confident in practicing social work or in whatever area that we uh, need to build that ability to be a professional. So some of the skills besides critical thinking, 
that people in behavioral sciences need are demonstrating ethical and professional behaviors. We talked a little bit now in our Zoom meeting about the importance of um, appearance as a professional. So you're gonna wanna take care of yourself. And one of the things that I've recognized in my 56 years on the planet is that it, when I get up in the morning, if I take the time to um, you know shower, pick, clothes that I'm comfortable in and do my makeup and hair and things like that. You know, if I feel confident about who I am, then I can look in the mirror and go, okay, I'm good. Now I can quit focusing on myself and focus on others. And that's a very, very important concept for people in our line of work. We wanna be able to, to extend professionalism by not being self-focused. I, I think a, a good definition of a professional is someone who is able to focus on others and not themselves. So uh, another social work skill is engaging diversity and difference in practice, being able to um, adapt, adjust, recognize that we live in uh, an, an area of the planet where there is diversity. A lot of people might say, yeah, rural Nevada, you don't get a whole lot of diversity. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Yes, you do. <laughs> there's diversity of thought, there's diversity of race, there's diversity of religion. And so it's important to be diverse. It's important to get out of your comfort zone and uh, connect with people that aren't within, that aren't necessarily part of the circle that you're comfortable with. It's okay to be uncomfortable because that's how we learn. That's how we grow. Another skill that is important is um, to advance human rights and social, economic, and environmental justice. Uh, so advancing, advancing social justice. This is one of our roles, uh, something that we do in our example, how we treat others, what we talk about, what we laugh at, what we're willing to um, accept as part of conversation. We, we do this in many, many different areas. I think when we hear the, the term social justice, we think of macro level activities, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one that we are, are changing how people think by not accepting when someone makes a racial slur or a homophobic slur, we are making a difference in terms of social justice. Okay, the next one is engage in practice-informed research and research-informed practice. So we talk a lot about evidence-based practice. What does this mean? It means that we don't do or say something unless we have that research that backs us up. When you guys are writing papers at the 300 level, it's important that you are using the APA style formatting and that you are citing your sources. If the idea isn't your own, then please cite where it came from. Let me know what books you're reading. Let me know if it came from the textbook or from some other source. And that is what makes it evidence-based. Engage in policy practice. So, Looking at the policies around us, looking at policy at, at our different agencies that we're working, that we're a part of, at the, the school systems maybe, um, hospitals, legal offices, what are the policy that, that need to be changed? What is their policy that is archaic, that um, isn't promoting social justice, that isn't making a difference for individuals who are vulnerable, who need a voice, who need someone who will have their back. Um, I always like to like to say, look at the individual. You know, bring it down to how that policy is going to help or hurt one person, because that's what we're here. And as as we um, as we serve one at a time, one individual at a time, then we can make a big difference. I lived in Alaska for quite a while, and um, there was a, 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 a saying among the Eskimos in Alaska that it takes a whole lot of snowflakes to make a glacier, but glaciers carve out mountains. And so, um, you know, one by one, we change individual lives, and, and uh, we can change the entire culture by doing that. So um, it, 
whatever your social justice issue is that you want to get on a soapbox and uh, stand up for, that is appropriate. So um, engage with individuals, families, groups, organiga organizations, and communities. Again, we start out at the micro level, but then we move into the meso level and on into the macro level. And we do this, you know, you're not gonna change an individual. Um, you're not going to help them with their problems a lot of the times unless you can help in their family culture, right? So if you've got a little child, when I was, when I was working with um, kids, one of the things that I noticed, and I worked with a lot of autistic children when I was practicing social work, excuse me, one of the things that I noticed is that a lot of times if there was challenging behavior within a child, it was the parent that had more of a problem than the child did. <laughs> and so um, we need to, to help individuals change, to help individual problems. Sometimes we need to get the entire family involved. Sometimes we might need to change the attitude of larger groups that, that those individuals are a part of. You have to believe in change if you really want to be an effective professional. Um, and definitely in social work, that's something that is an important concept. Assess individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. So we engage with them, but we also assess them. We step back, we evaluate. Social workers are not always talkers. A lot of the times we need to sit back and observe, be the Jane Austens of the world. For those of you who, who love Jane Austen novels or movies, <laughs> I love that Jane Austen was one of the, if you, if you know anything about her life, she was one of those individuals that, that observed culture. And so she was able to write about it in a way that we still value today. We still look at the relationships that she wrote about, the characters that she created, which she took from her life experience, and, um, and they're still applicable because she studied society so well. A lot of people believe she was on the autism spectrum and so she didn't quite fit in socially. And so part of her strategy to better understand the culture was to observe it and write about it. That's what we do as social workers. We, we observe and we assess what's going on. We don't just judge something by its face value. We dig in and we better understand what's going on. Um, I, I, let me give you just a, a quick example. And some of you have heard this. I'll probably share it again. But um, when I was in graduate school, I heard this, this example that one of my professors gave of a little girl who came to her mother and said, um, um, my stepdad put his PP in my PP. And of course, the mother was appalled. She kicked her husband out of the home and uh, took her child to a child psychologist. And it took a few weeks, but they finally figured out that what the little girl was saying is that she had, she had just gone potty. She was potty training and she had just gone potty. She didn't flush the toilet. And then she noticed that her stepdad went in and he urinated in the toilet right after she did. For whatever reason, that was upsetting to the little kid. And so um, if she had been taught correct language, she would have said, uh, stepdaddy urinated in the toilet that had my urine in it, rather than he put his pee pee in my pee pee. <laughs> so um, I, I share that with, with a lot of audiences, um, and especially my students, to help them understand the importance of teaching children correct language. But um, I think this is a, a good example of when we're assessing, a lot of the times we need to dig in and it took the, psycho the, the um, social worker, it took her a while to figure out what the child meant. But what she had to do was just interpret what a three-year-old meant by pee pee. And once she got that down, she was able to um, <laughs> recognize that nothing ab abhorrent had occurred, so. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about assessing. Okay, uh, the next one is intervene with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. So intervening is something that we do. We don't just sit back and watch things happen. We step up and make a difference. We are the voice for the vulnerable. And uh, it's, uh, 
It's an honor to be able to work with these individuals. It's an honor to be their voice, and a lot of them really need that. And when I was working as a domestic violence um, instructor for court-ordered clients, I had one man who came in who had been accused of um, abusing his spouse when it was after several weeks of court-ordered domestic violence classes, he finally came out with this uh, very embarrassing for him to admit that he actually had been the victim of abuse. And um, that was really challenging for this individual. So how do you intervene? I mean, the courts intervened because the wife had accused the husband, but um, I was able to intervene and, and clarify what had occurred in this um, family. But what was really interesting is that education, these court-ordered classes, really empowered this man to be able to, you know, step back and get away from a toxic relationship in which he had been accused when he was the victim. So um, we intervene. We, we attempt to make a difference. And the last one is evaluate practice with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. We evaluate, we uh, look at what has occurred, and we try to, you know, again, we use evidence-based, and um, we record what has gone on, and part of the reason for that is because it promotes, it validates what we have uh, attempted to do in changing a situation. Okay, uh, the next area I wanna discuss with you guys today is phases of social work practice. And this comes, comes back to um, some of the skills that we've just gone over. So phases include engaging, assessing, intervening, and evaluating. And we just talked about those four stages, but why are they phases? They're, they're phases because um, when we're in that phase, that is what we focus on. So at the beginning of working with an individual or a group or a community, we, um, we're engaging, we prepare, we build rapport. Uh, a big part of beginning to work with somebody is building that rapport, building trust, validating what they've been through is part of the engaging process. Um, we assess what's going on. We we, contra we contract with individuals. When I worked as a school social worker, I did a lot of contracting with individuals. So um, having them sign a contract about behavior and that kind of thing. We intervene, we work, we evaluate, and we intervene with these individuals. And the, the last phase is to evaluate and um, let's move on to dimensions of professionalism. So the first dimension is integrity. What is integrity? I think a good working definition is basically doing what you'll say you'll do, okay? You have integrity if you, when you say something, you do what you say you'll do. And uh, when my husband was in, in his undergraduate program at Texas A&M University, um, it was a marketing class, but the very first day of class, and this all these years later, this is what he remembers, that uh, the professor wrote on the board, do what you say you will do. And he said, if you do this, you will be successful in whatever area of business you decide to go into. And uh, so that kind of had a profound impact. Integrity is important. We're, we're honest. We do everything that we can to help our individuals, but we have professional boundaries. And a big part of professional boundaries is integrity. If, um, if someone can't shake your integrity, then, then uh, you know, and you know what? It will happen. People will try <laughs> to do that. Um, but uh, that's an important part of being a professional. The second one is self-understanding and self-control. Several of you in our Zoom meeting talked about self-control and how you see that as, as an attribute of a professional. 
definitely. You know, when when someone is losing it emotionally, and I, I like to say this uh, in, um, I taught parenting, court-ordered parenting classes for years and years, but the definition of a good parent is someone who stays in control. And that's what a child needs is a, a a parent who is in control of their emotions because the kid is gonna lose it, right? That's what kids do. And they they don't have a whole lot of emotional control. They're learning how to do that. And as parents, we model for them how to control their emotions by how we behave in certain situations. Yeah, if you're the mom or, or dad of a teenager, it can be really challenging because a lot of us are motivated by fear, and I'll tell you what, when you've got a teenager kind of flushing his or her life down the toilet, that first emotion that you have is fear, and fear often masks as anger, right? Anger is a secondary emotion. The primary emotion is most of the time fear, and so <laughs> it's easy to lose it, to uh, lose our self-control, not demonstrate self-control, and express anger when we have fear going on as parents. The same thing will happen in the professional arena. And so it's important to recognize what that primary emotion is when we're expressing anger. Uh, the next one, the next dimension of professionalism is knowledge, expertise, and self-efficacy. What does that mean? Obviously, you're getting the knowledge now. I hope that you are consuming these textbooks and really enjoying them, digging into them. For me, it was my, my undergraduate and graduate school experience. I read textbooks out loud in recording devices <laughs> because I learn better. Um, I'm an audio learner, and so I learn better when I listen to it. I didn't learn it the first time reading it. I list, when I listened to it is when I learned and better understood the concepts. So I hope you're using every area that you can to become more knowledgeable. And um, expertise, uh, that develops as you go along. I know that right now many of you are passionate about a certain area of mental health and mental health um, and that's great, but trust me, it will evolve as you uh, do a residency or internship, it will evolve and you'll probably find yourself in um, all kinds of opportunities that you didn't realize that you would love, but you will. The next one, the next dimension of professionalism is social support and well-being. As a social worker, as anyone working in behavioral health, you need support, all right? Social support is vital, especially in our post-COVID world. Boy, we need to be able to connect with others. We need to have people who recognize how stressful our chosen profession is and are there for us. Um, we need to be able to depend on, on each other as well. And um, a lot of the times, the things that we deal with we can't talk about with um, our loved ones. It's just too overwhelming for people who aren't in this profession, which is why we build professional relationships. Those are very, very important. Um, diversity and difference is the next dimension of professionalism. So uh, being a professional means accepting diversity, being a diverse, person recognizing that, um, again, outside of our comfort zone is an okay place to be. And human rights and social, economic, and environmental justice. These are areas, dimensions of professionalism that are important. Human rights, I mean, there's, that, there's a, a wide uh, variety of rights that everybody should have access to. And, um, there's different definitions of what that means to different people. Policy practice is another dimension of professionalism that's important. Again, uh, research the policy of the different organizations that you're a part of and make sure that you, are, uh, that you agree and that those policies are, um, are up to date with what is important. Social work values and ethics and ethical decision-making. So um, 
Definitely use your code of ethics. For those of you not in social work, um, I think you'll still find the code of ethics a valuable document. And we use these. It's kind of our Bible to recognize when something is appropriate, when it's not. When, uh, when we have an ethical decision to make, that code of ethics really comes in handy. So that is the, uh, everything I wanted to talk about today. Social work has a change-oriented mission. I love that. That's just a statement from your textbook. Again, if you don't believe in change, it's very difficult to be a social worker. I have seen clients change, and it's not easy for them. But the, the most wonderful thing about a social work a career is that not only will you see change in those you work with, you'll see change in yourself too. And I'm excited to work with you guys this semester. Please don't hesitate to text, email, or call me if you have any questions or concerns. And we'll see you next week.